it's Michael E. Gerber, the wandering Jew, and yes, I do wander. And Rabbi Levi Kunin, the practicing Jew, and yes, he does practice. In fact, I come to call it the observant Jew, as opposed to the practicing Jew, because I think the practicing Jew um, gives birth to the observant Jew, and I'm just wondering, <laughs> I'm just wondering, and I don't know what happened to me, but here we are. So, Levi Kunin, how are you? Baruch Hashem, good. Good to see you, uh, Michael, and uh, good to be back speaking in the morning. Thank God we're here. I'm grateful Thank to be alive and grateful to be breathing and be healthy, and you look healthy and look good today, so it's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we're here. So, Levi, you invited me in the last minute, as you always do, uh, to attend a conversation that you were having on Zoom with another gentleman, and it was about the Kabbalistic um, uh, relationship to anxiety. And it struck me as very interesting. And in fact, when I got done with my meeting, I tried to get on, but it was already over. Um, so I would like you to um, summarize what that conversation um ended up saying. All right, so, um, you know, one of the, uh, before we get into that conversation, I think I shared with you, uh, if I ever tell a joke that seems like it's not related in the beginning of a conversation, I want, just want to remind you, it's because of the fact that when we laugh, we open ourselves up to higher ability of learning <laughs> when we're in a state of, state of joy, okay? <laughs> So there's like the story about uh, about this kid who went away for to, to college and he calls his father and he says, Dad, I need a hundred bucks. He says, a hundred bucks? What do you need 80 bucks for? You're gonna lose the 60 bucks as soon as I give it to you. Fine, I'll give you the 40 and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, the, in order to get, the, the point is the following that, number one, in order to be able to overcome anything there's a rule in, in, in Kabbalah, which is, if you think about it, just a universal rule that Kabbalah is teaching us about, is that in order to bring about a change in something, you got to go to its root. You have to go to its root. To its root. The actual wording of it in Kabbalah is the sweetening of the judgment is at its roots. So let me give, give you an example of what I mean by that. Just a simple example, okay? Say someone walks into your office when you don't expect them, triggers every single one of your triggers, where you're about to, who knows what, but right before you're able to completely get angry, you find out the person's just an actor that your best friend hired from Craigslist to read that script and to come in there and play with you. At that moment, the whole event changes. At that moment, it's like you want to, you want to, you want to make sure you're going to get back at your friend in a way that he's never ever received it from you, right? <laughs> but it's no longer what it was just a couple seconds ago, and that's because the moment you were able to go back to its root of what it really is, then suddenly you could release it, you could sweeten it. So this is also true about when people have conflict with each other. But but let me. Yeah. I'm not going to do yes, but okay. Go ahead but I can't help but doing yes. Go ahead. Um, but you wouldn't know that in that moment. Correct. Um, you wouldn't know that until later. Or, 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 and this is where Kabbalah comes in, says you have the ability to actually get to that moment before that moment happens. You have, if you were had the proper tools, you could immediately decipher, this guy's an actor, if you had the proper tools, you could immediately decipher something else is going on. It's not what it looks and, like. And when, Calm down. Say, and when you say the proper tools. So that's where the conversation of the esoteric part of Torah comes in, where Kabbalah okay. comes in. Okay. Because anxiety and anything that we have a reaction to, as we've talked about yesterday, about the narrative that we all grew up in. So we have a narrative of if this, then that. If my boss fires me, my life is over. If this person tells on me, my life is over. 
whatever, all these different things, right? And that's all the narrative. In fact, a dear friend of mine has gone through a total, total drastic extreme change from living on the beach to, you know, like calling me every day on the phone. How do I get over my fears? How do I go? He lost everything. And that's because in the narrative that we are accustomed to, then the moment we're about to lose something in the way that we understand what it is, a something is, and suddenly the balls of anxiety go on. And they go on in the highest, the deepest level, okay? But what the Kabbalah invites us to do is to go into a deeper conversation and to have a deeper understanding of what it, the events are happening, being able to put them in perspective. Not that we understand the events all the time, but be able to at least place the matter in its proper perspective. And what I mean by that is that the whole idea of the fear at the first place of any fear has to be a corrupt feeling. And I'll tell you why. Has to be addressed what? Ha has to be a corrupt feeling. Oh, has to be a corrupt feeling. Correct. Okay. Meaning it's, it's a... In it, in it itself, if one were really to converse into that fear, if, if we were to, to really understand that there are certain fears that are controlling us, well, first of all, understand that if we're going to go for those fears, then we have every reason at every second to fear. I think today, more than ever, we look at that with the coronavirus. We have no idea. What are, people can walk around all day thinking today's their last day. You know? um, but at the same time, you know, I'm blessed to be able to look at the ocean every day and to watch nature unfold, the beautiful creation of God, and to watch birds come, pelicans and other birds, seagulls coming from the 100 feet in the air and boom into the ocean with a fish in their mouth. Who's making that happen? What's making that happen? What's feeding every single creature? What's sustaining everything? What's bringing about the birth of a something from a nothing? From a seed comes a tree. And this is where King David invites us in Psalms to get more present to that conversation, to at least observe with the mind's eye that number one, our creator is, a for, is not defined by anything, but is a force of goodness. Like King David says in Psalms, that open up your hands, you open up your hands and you satiate to every living creature in accordance to its desire, in accordance to its will. <clears throat> so anyway, not to go off of that, but the point is that when we get into higher conversation, then suddenly the events that are giving us anxiety are placed in a different framework. And we're seeing them energetically, perhaps more importantly, than we are in its practical manifest form. And most importantly, we're able to identify that the fear that we have been living in is a baseless fear. Yes, there could be some real issues, but at the core of it, it must be a baseless fear. Just to finish with a story, then I want to hear what your, your thoughts are. Um, I, I shared the story on the class, story of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, who I have been sharing with you about. You could uh, go to hashtag DP frequency and you'll learn much more about the Baal Shem Tov, divine providence frequency. So the Baal Shem Tov one time was approached by one of his students who was just poverty struck him. I mean, this guy, he was a sweet, holy guy, but you just couldn't put his ends together. And he came to the Baal Shem Tov and he asked the Baal Shem Tov, I don't know how to, how to live in, with to trust that Hashem's going to take care of me. How can I, how can I live with a trust that Hashem's going to take care of me? I learn about it. I, I meditate on it. I pray on it. But how am I supposed to get present to it? Every day I go to sleep and not know what's going to happen tomorrow. So Baal Shem Tov told him to go see Yankel, the innkeeper, and uh, he'll get his answer. And he went to Yankel, the innkeeper, he went with a buddy of his. They went in a right away. They went to Yankel, the innkeeper. In those days, the inns were owned by counts who often were great anti-Semites. They would give the Jew the motel, the bed and breakfast. 
at a very, very premium price against the sales, etc. but at a very premium price. And that many Jews made a, made a living being innkeepers. It happened to be that uh, the Yankel was one of them. These two students end up by the, his motel. And as soon as Yankel hears that these are two students of the Baal Shem Tev, he's so excited. He says, come in, have a seat. And while he's sitting there talking to them, there's a knock on his door. And they're observing everything because the Baal Shem Tev sent them there. They knew that he, there was a big lesson there. And there were some, some official looking guys there. He has a quick conversation. He comes back to the table. He says, I'm so happy you guys are here. Continue your conversation. Where were we holding? A couple of hours later, the same thing happens. They say, what happened? He says, ah, it's nothing. Don't worry. And the third time he says, so listen, I got to go for a little bit. You continue talking amongst yourselves. I'll come back soon. They go to the window to watch what happened. And in short, he was being taken to prison. Miraculously, something happened with another wagon. I won't go into all the details. And a half hour later, he's back. Or an hour later, he's back. He sits down. He says, where were we holding in our story? And they go, no, 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 no. We need to know what happened to you. The Baal Shem Tev sent us here to learn a lesson from you. He says, that's not important. God takes care of us. He says, what happened? So basically, he said, I was two years behind in rent. Three months ago, the count said, if I don't come up with all the cash on this day, he'll take me to prison. A month ago, he told me this, that in the morning of the day, they'll knock on my door and let me remind me. In the afternoon, they'll remind me. And then they'll be taking me to prison. I tried to get the money. I did my best. I couldn't. And I knew that God is going to look out for me. I had no other choice but to trust Hashem. As I was being taken to prison, another count from a different city came and, and asked me if I can supply his daughter's wedding with liquor. He asked me how much would it be. I added up all the money I owed to the count for the motel. And I put on top of it how much it would cost me. And I told him, he said, are you crazy? That's so much money. He said, that's the only price I could do it for you. The guy left and a minute later came back and said, you know, you're the only guy I could trust that you'll get the job done and money's not a big deal to me, so take it. He said, I went to pay back the count for the two years that I owed him. And here I am, tell me the next story about the Baal Shem Tov because that's more important. Now, how does somebody live in the presence of mind being able to have a conversation like that? And at the same time, being faced with immediate danger with the unknown. And that's where the conversation of mysticism lends itself to us, to our consciousness, to our not just, it's not to, to just our faith, but to our consciousness, our awareness that we're able to absorb and be able to therefore take in the events of our life with different lenses, with a different perspective, with one that's actually more rooted in truth. When we begin to un unravel it, when we begin to take off the layers we start to realize that this is something that we know within ourselves. It's not something from the outside. And it's something that just like we know, we don't question gravity. We know that if we let go of something, it's gonna fall. When we get to the presence of the spiritual science of our reality, then suddenly that which brings us anxiety triggers other thoughts and other responses that are nothing to do with fear. So I hope I made sense to you, but that was the summation. It, it does. So let me give you your my wandering Jew's response to that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, what you just shared is a story. And it's a story from 300 years ago. And I'm to presume <clears throat> that it's a true story, not a story made up um, 60 years ago um, to make a point. And so I'm saying that these stories, while they're obviously making the point that you are attempting to make, which is that our fears are ungrounded. They're simply a reflection upon um, how our mind is trained to work. If this, then that, et cetera, and so forth. Um, the spiritual world doesn't work that way. That's what you're telling me. Well, there's, a there's an if this and then that in the spiritual world, but it's a very, very different narrative. Yes, well, I'm saying there is if this, then that, but it's a very different narrative. Correct. Right, I Correct. got that. I got that. Um, I'm sorry I didn't express it 
the way you just no, no, that's fine. I just want to, you, you, you did. I just want to make sure that, you know, it's not like it is in the spiritual realm. It's not a random thing. It's also if this, then that. It's just a completely if this, then that. You get it? <laughs> like, you know, it's like, it's like if, if, if you, if you, it, it's in, in, in science, they tell you if you don't smoke and you never blah, 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 then you're not going to get lung cancer. And how many people do I know that got lung cancer and never smoked a cigarette, right? So I'm saying is that there's, there's the, the if this and that is true, but not true all the time. But there's a different if this and that energetically, that if a person is charitable, then it could, it could actually change a person's destiny. So if it was governed in the higher spiritual system that today a person's gonna die, that person did an, a, ra- a random act of goodness and, t- and kindness, that becomes a new if this, and the new if that, it could be that that person survives. That, has, that will manifest itself in one way or another in the physical world, but that is the event. The event that's in the physical world is simply a manifestation of the if this, then that of spiritual sp- science. I hear you. I hear you. So um, somebody listening in to our conversation, um, I'm not going to say I'm the wandering Jew, ergo I'm saying this. <laughs> Somebody's listening to our conversation who doesn't believe, who doesn't have faith, who doesn't believe in the stories that you're telling him or I'm telling him or I'm telling her or you're telling her. Um, how do they go into their experience and discover the essence of what you're saying to be true? Without <clears throat> studying Torah, without making a commitment um, to read Torah every day, which is what a practicing Jew does every day. Um, without that, how do they begin to experience what you're talking about in the day-to-day experience of their lives? So first of all, I want to just say, uh... I want to first, before I answer that, I want to just tell you a different story of it that's personal. So it's not 300 years ago. I'll it's give you what? the short, the personal. Okay. That's not 300 years ago. And this story happened with my father. I mean, I, I have many other stories that are personal on my own, but it's, this, was a, this was a big one. Happened with my father years ago. A long story short, uh, he owed $2 million to the Mexicana Bank. And on a certain building and they, they wanted the money back. The loan was up and he couldn't figure out how to get a different loan. He was a nonprofit. Long story short, it, he writes to the Rebbe and the Rebbe answers him. He gives the Rebbe different options what he should do and the Rebbe answers him, just be happy. Could you imagine? Just trust Hashem, be happy. So it's two weeks before he's about to lose like everything that he had then. And he, he writes to the Rebbe, he's, being, he's doing everything he can to be happy, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and he gets an answer from the Rebbe. But he says, but he's still blah, blah, blah. Just be happy. And then my father ends up in court and he tries to make a deal with the, uh, with the Mexicana Bank. And the lawyer said, we're not accepting any deals, blah, blah, blah. And the judge looked at the case and it was a slam dunk against uh, my father. And my father asked the judge if he would be so kind to give them a 15 minute break. And the judge simply feeling bad for him, allowed him to have the 15 minute break. And my father goes out, those days there were no cell phones. He goes to the payphone. He calls the Rebbe's office. He says, what do I do? It's about, to, it's about to happen. And the Rebbe secretary says to my father, the Rebbe said, I should be expecting your call. And when you call, I should tell you, you should start dancing. <laughs> so my father and his buddies that were there, not knowing what's going on, thinking that in 15 minutes, he's about to lose everything he worked so hard on. And he comes into the court 15 minutes later and 20 minutes and 25 minutes and a half hour, the other lawyers are not there yet. And finally, they walk into the courtroom and they tell the judge, judge will accept Rabbi Kunin's offer that he made before. At this point, my father, having the chutzpah of all chutzpah says, your honor, no more offers. 
All offers from now have to be out of court. That offer's off the table. <laughs> he knew that something was going on. What if has something happened? Well, you know, he, suddenly he started, he saw that mirror, the moment of the miracle. And the judge says, Rabbi, they have everything against. They don't have to do this. They could take it. He says, Your Honor, with all due respect, you know, I want to do it. It should be outside of court. And sure enough, they agreed to it. And then afterwards, it was found out that Senator Rudy Boschwitz, God bless him, he intervened. And because of uh, different, different things and, and relationships that he had, he was able to completely take off the pressure from it. I share this story because I remember hearing this story growing up with my father and realizing, and not just realizing, like in, an, in, a, in a identifying, a knowing that if that happens once, that can happen all the time. So your question is how do, how do how do we hook into it, right? And how do we how do we connect to it? And um, I want to tell you just a, a, the, another story, a quick one with my father that answers that question. I believe my father was on his pl- on a plane. He goes on the plane. He tries to get the Jewish men to put on tefillin. And um, one guy who's not Jewish says to my father, "You know, I'm not a believer. I, I, I don't. I'm an atheist." So my father said, I want to ask you a question. Is there, a, is there at least one story in your whole life that made you think, maybe, maybe yes, maybe, maybe, maybe it's there. And the guy got a, a little emotional. And he said when I was, he was from UK, he says when I was 25 years old, I was, tra- he was traveling around Europe. And at some point I had, a, I had this, this, uh, this pass to go wherever I wanted to go. And uh, around Europe, and then some point I realized, oh my gosh, just um, if I don't catch the ferry, I'm completely broke. I have no way to get back to to, to my mainland, and I have no money, etc. He said I was a couple of hours away from the ferry. I knew I had to be in a rush. I went out to hitchhike. The first couple cars came. They said, "No, we're not. We're not going that direction." And finally, one car, an elderly gentleman, invited me into the car. I got into the car, and as he's driving, I'm realizing if he doesn't put his pedal to the metal, we're not going to get there on time. And he says, uh, sir, I can't tell you how grateful I am for giving me the ride. Could I just beg you, please go a little quicker just so we could get there. And he looks and he says, young man, you got no worries. We're not going to miss the ferry. And he's quiet and he's holding in his anxiety because if he doesn't make this, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And he sees, he's looking at his watch. There's no way. And he, he's, he, he, gets, he has to fight, can't help himself. He blurts it out. He says, he says, please. He says, I, I hate to, to put pressure. You're so nice to me. You brought me on. And he says, young man, you got nothing to worry about. And when they pulled up to the parking lot of the ferry, the young man sees the elderly gentleman take out his captain hat and say, come, young man, let's go to the ferry. I'm your captain. (laughs) (laughs) We're out of time. We're out of time. Like me, you already told me that story once. Yeah, but we hadn't heard it, so I wanted you to conclude it. Conclude it. No worry. No worry. No worry. But, 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 no worry, please. I'm the captain of the ship. Okay, I love you. I love you. I'll I'll talk to you tomorrow. (laughs) Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. This is Mike Lee Gerber speaking to you from Carlsbad, California, and Rabbi Levi Kunin from Malibu, California, overlooking the ocean. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.